All right, so now we're going to talk about solve by factoring. And again, at this point, if I see something that I could have squared, I'll mention or something similar. I will definitely mention what that would look like. So here we have our first example. We are solving by factoring. How do I recognize that I'm solving by factoring? I see two distinctly different trigs. So I know I have to do some manipulation. This could be factor it out. This could be um, using greatest common factors or trinomial factorization that's allowed. Or I could use technically the quadratic equation. Uh, there's a lot of different methods I could use there. Technically, there's also other algebraic solves here. We could square to force the Pythagorean identity or we could um, use trig identities as a manipulation. But the way this is set up, I don't see an identity that's easily manipulated, and I don't see um, potentially the Pythagorean identity available. Because if I squared both of these, sure, this guy would turn into cosine. Uh, you know what? You know, maybe that would work. Peanut butter and jelly tells me now that I'm looking at it, that may have actually worked out for us. But I'm going to show it to you as factoring because that looks like the easier method. Um, if you're going to square this one, it looks like it would expand a lot bigger before it got smaller. So if you want to see me about that question, we can totally work it out in class or in tutoring together. But I'm going to go ahead and show this as if it was a factor. How did I know again that this was another factor? Because if I move everything to one side, I recognize a greatest common factor, a repeating value of sign. That's the other reason why I knew to stick with factoring instead of squaring or any other algebraic manipulation. So I rip out that greatest common factor and do my division appropriately, and I end up with these two factorable values. Since I have two factorable values set equal to zero, if you recall from algebra, if you had some function and you um, factored it out to this, you are allowed to split these up and set both sides equal to zero. And that's how you finish this solve, right? Okay, so that's the same thing we're doing here. We're gonna split both up and set them equal to zero. So that's what I did. On the right-hand side, I'm gonna have to finish that solve. But on the left-hand side, we were ready to go. And ooh, this, this is a typo on my screen. You can tell this should have said cosine inverse of the square root of 3 over 2 is equal to x. So there are my two actual solve for x's, and then I use the hand trick to finish. Again, there's a typo here. I should have already inverted this, so you should know that this should say this. Cool. So finish the solve by using the hand trick. And I end up with these two values. Again, if you're struggling with the inverse, whether you use the hand trick, chart trick, first quadrant, unit circle, doesn't matter. If you're still struggling to do that without Googling a unit circle or Googling the answer, you are already a little bit behind and I need you to play some catch up. I need you to do something about it. Tutoring, con, whatever makes sense to you, work through those questions. All right. So because we're looking for the positive quadrant over here, I was allowed to reject 5 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6. And on the left-hand side, there is nothing to reject because the sine of 0 simply is occurring at 0 and occurring at pi. There is no rejection on that one. Since I have a period of 0 to 2 pi, all four are my answer, and I tack in my coterminal um, value. If I start failing to tack this in, just be aware that you need to start tacking those in as well. It'll be in every multiple choice. And so I want to make sure you recognize that that is accounting for all possible solutions because it does tell you to find all solutions. All right. So here's another example. So last time we did a greatest common factor. What if I see that this is actually a factorable trinomial? Okay. You could have done it a little different, but I went ahead and said we can factor. So if I change sign of x into just x or whatever variable makes you happy then i see that this is a factorable trinomial so if 2x squared plus x minus 1 factors into this then so should 2 sine squared plus sine x minus 1. so now i have my factored form set equal to zero guess what i can do if you guess split them up and set them equal to zero you are correct if i finish the solve on both sides then i have where i'm able to finish the solve for x so I invert them and finish the solve for x. Now I need to use some sort of trick to finish my solve. In our learning example, I consistently use the hand trick. So I found these as my answers. With negative 1, there is only one answer. The other answer of pi over 2 has to be positive 1. So please don't make that mistake. Now I triple check. Everything is good to go. These are all the correct, correct positive negative quadrants and all of my answers. But am I in my interval? Well, the interval is from 0 to 2 pi. 
for sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant. So I can reject all these other ones in the green, but I cannot reject the answers I have on screen. Boom, I don't forget to tack in my coterminal uh, accountability, and now I've accounted for every solution that could possibly be, you know, here are my intervals, here are my questions on the interval, and then this accounts for everything outside of it. Okay. All right, so find all solutions on the interval. So this is the one in class that I said, I'm just going to show you, you could have started it, but I told you in the video, I would show you the finished salt. So there are two different ways that I could approach this, or there's a lot of different ways I could approach this. You could have done trig manipulation if you're like, hey, I want to make it to one trig or something like that. That's fine. I recognize that this is a factor. And so I'm going to do something called U subfactoring. You guys might recognize what this is, is where you literally say, okay, well, this is this variable, so I'm going to finish the solve. So if I say that x to the fourth is just, or x squared is just U, then this becomes 2x squared squared minus x squared. So I'm able to replace that with U. This is easy to recognize as a factor, right? So I can factor that out. Or some of you are like, Miss Jag, I could have factored this. That's fine, too. I'm just showing the kids who maybe needed an extra step. Okay, but if you got it down to this is your factor, then you did this correctly. And if I know that this is the factor with variables, then can't I plug my trig back in? In fact, I can. So there's my factored trig value. Set equal to zero means I can split them up and set them equal to zero. Finish the solve on both sides. And now I've got to deal with that square root. Look what happens on the left-hand side. Can I square root a negative value? Absolutely not. So because I'm even rooting a negative value, I've got to reject that side. And that's okay. But let's deal with the right-hand side. I can get a plus or minus 3. So I can invert the right-hand side. So I can finish this using whatever trick makes sense to you. I use the hand trick. And these are my four answers. But again, we may have to reject some answers. So pi or tan lies on the interval 0 to pi naturally. So I'm going to reject two answers of 4 pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. And just to account for all possible solutions outside of that interval, I account for my co-terminal angles of that repetition, rep, rep, repetitive, repetitive period um, where cotan or tan, you know, they kind of continually repeat. And so if I shift my intervals over, that's why we account for those. All right. We also have to check our asymptotes occurring at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 on that standard value. Since none of my answers occur there, I don't reject those. Okay. Alrighty. Here is your turn. 